Okay, well, does that fit? Today's is the judgment. Uh, and you, you can notice the resurrection that's taking place in this human that's rising from the tomb. Uh, here, the hero wakes to a new and heavenly life on earth. And psychologically, they're entering a dimension of awareness that was previously beyond them. So the, the spirit, this moment of spiritual resurrection shows for the first time the human facing the source of the illumination, because you know, notice that he's actually facing the angel. And previously it, it took place above and behind the figures. They felt its effects, but only indirectly. Whereas now the central figure consciously perceives and hears the call. The immediacy of this connection was shown by the angel's size and by the enormous trumpet, which almost pierces the earth, the blast enough to shatter the eardrums of those below. The beginning of a new order is at hand, a new interaction between the conscious and unconscious, which will become manifest in the last card, the world. The person who has returned is now far different than the one who set forth. He appears as a young man. From the viewpoint of everyday consciousness, he has seemed lost or dead, but now he returns renewed in both body and spirit, revitalized by his contact with the earth and his adventures in the subterranean depths. The four figures may represent the four functions, sensation, intuition, thinking, and feeling. We imagine that back in the tower, here we go. We imagine that back in the tower, only a single function was developed. And to be freed from this incarceration, it was necessary to be hit by a bolt of lightning. This blow probably left him confused and depressed for a long time. And after his journey to the depths, he will hopefully be able to operate through not only thinking, but his other aspects as well. That he emerges from the tomb, a grown man, and yet being reborn indicates that he was formerly alive and active in this world. The guess that the hero was a thinking type is supported by the tarot card, the lover, where we see him faced with a conscious discrimination in the feeling area where he was completely helpless. His logical thinking did nothing for him. Trapped in his submerged feelings, his body twisting one way, his head the other, he was completely helpless. His logical thinking was no aid. He had no awareness of, of arrows. His ability to handle the wound was limited and he ends up choosing neither of the two ladies seeking his intention. Instead, he rides off in the chariot, fixated on the material. Next, we see him in the Tower of Destruction. The mobile chariot is now a rigid tower, encapsulated above all nature and removed from life. He has acquired a female companion, but she is also a prisoner. Because the tower is so rigid, it requires a tremendous bolt of lightning to move him from his fixed position. Suddenly one finds that it is simply no longer possible to proceed along the same track, the same position. But in the judgment card, the hero is redeemed, which literally means not that he has found something new outside of himself, but rather the aspects which were held hostage in the psyche are now liberated. This increased awareness will come with a price, an increased responsibility. The challenge of a new light must be faced. He has gained new partners whose needs and wishes must be considered. The heavenly presence places its own burden. If he fails in these new responsibilities, he may, may well end up back in the tower. The gravity of the situation is shown in the emotional atmosphere of the judgment. The other figures show the solemnity and gravity of the situation. There is no wild dancing or jubilation. His companions look to him and he looks to the angel. He now hears the call to serve a power higher than himself. In this row, we've seen death and rebirth, death of the old ego and its resurrection in a new form. What was sacrificed was the willful ego. We are now dedicated to a power beyond. Here's a quick review of the journey. 
and the lover of the hero's ego received its first wound. From here, he sets out to conquer the world in the chariot. In death, a more complete dismemberment takes place, but he still emerges intact. But now he is no longer alone. He has a female partner. We saw these two in the devil as naked subhumans, unwilling to turn and confront their devilish potentials. They cover their tails and hoofs with clothing that everyone is wearing and escape the devil by incarceration in the tower. In the judgment, the hero and his companions stand naked, so no false pretensions, personas, um, exposed to one another and the influence of heavenly powers. The angelic figure in the sky has become more humanized. His expression shows more intensity and human feeling than we could see in the faces of the previous cards, and he is communicating with the figures below. This communication between all the characters marks an important breakthrough. This gives the promise that the qualities of each may be brought together and consolidated in the one complete being, a human being. So that is today's. We've only got, we've only got one more to go. Okay, well, and we, we can definitely review them. Uh, you, you know, what's interesting about this is the... Uh, uh, you, you know the the blowing of the horn in alchemy is to is to awaken our dead soul. You know our inner world is what it's really awakening. And and I love the image of everyone is is dis is in their state of natural state. You know uh, the the idea of hitting. You know Jung said no one can become fully human until they touch bottom. And there's I think two aspects of touching bottom. One is is Baba Yaga with her mortar and pestle. You know that that uh, we need to uh, give up everything we have in the outer world. You know, and the second one is the one of going into the body in uh, you know the animal and instinctive realms. You know what what you Young said that the realms were were. Uh, you, you know, first the uh, just our unconscious aspect. Then there was the uh, uh, the next layer down was our youthful life, and uh, you know the sense of longing and what we were were informed by that. The next one is of the parents and and grandparents, and the next one is of the those ancestors we didn't know, and then is the cultural. And then it, it goes all the way down to the instinctive layer. But the idea of going there naked is the idea of that uh, going down through the seven gates with Inanna, uh, you know. And uh, anyway, the the, the second uh, we've left Muladhara, you know, the gods are starting to awake. It's the whole idea, you know. I, I'm going to put this link to that book uh, about, uh, about Young and Wolf, Tony Wolf. Hopefully it, it's going to open this time, <laughs> you know, but anyway, we're going to start uh, with this. Now, now we're just going to finish up today. The idea of the, uh, uh, it, it, the animus as it appears in the, in, in myth and the unconscious. And then uh, I think next time we're going to do some sharing if, if you wanted to, it's the first su Sunday in the month. We don't have to, but uh, if there is anybody that would like to do that, we can do that. Otherwise, the, after that, we're going to start with the uh, animus as it appears in consciousness, you know, and uh, and uh, uh, I just thought, and, and the whole idea of, of going back to this was that when I started reading uh, these animus fairy tales, you know, they're fairly literal. <laughs> and I think that we need to, we need to defang the literalism before we go into them so that we know. But I, I wanted to uh, just say one thing that we're doing here is the idea of, of what the animus brings uh, the feminine consciousness is, uh, is where it, 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 it is, um, it brings it two aspects. Uh, one is, uh, uh, we learn this from Hephaestus and Loki, you know, um, uh, it is, is the creative aspect. And you know it's symbolized in in the I Ching, you know, by the uh, by the uh, six non-yielding lines, 
you know it represents heaven over heaven so this is the animus in a higher form it represents heaven over heaven it's nothing to do with earth there's no earthly qualities in it and it is all so it's all removed from the earth and yet what it provides is is the creative aspect and uh the uh, actual uh and in its impersonal form so it's it represents an impersonal quality that is uh uh objective and not it has nothing to do with relatedness you know uh and it and has to do with order uh uh the power to create the power to pursue infinite possibility these this energy needs to come in to the other realm which is the more elemental realm of this one which is uh this is the I Ching i always get you know is the six receptive lines the sick the receptive earth you know and uh uh this it represents earth represents life represents relatedness represents the near at hand and the, this is the feminine energy so these two energies need to unite and this one is the more primordial the other one is is the creative aspect and this this is what the I Ching says about the the mating of those two worlds you know uh this this is the mating of the two worlds heaven is not the wide blue sky but the place where the body is made in the house of the creative i just think that's so beautiful you know it's this uh what what it is is the creative aspects that's brought in to the body into the feminine realms and and brings it this creative aspect now you, you know the animus or the mythological figures that are known for that are the kabiri the underground uh uh dwarves the uh telesphoras and what do they do they they will forge things they make uh, uh, uh they make magic swords and other kinds of, of magical things but uh the uh two gods that are uh you know somewhat uh related to the uh uh, that are Hephaestus and uh, Loki. Here's here's Loki. Here, you know, you can see he's just this fire. He's the god. He is the creative of the uncontrolled fire. There is no control over his fire, and yet he's an energy within us, a creative energy within us. And then the other one is Hephaestus, who represents the 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 uh the smith he is the more controlled fire you know so and the idea of this aspect of the animus is to bring that uh uh through and how does it bring it through a, what we're going to consider today is the aspect of luring us into it you know seducing us seducing the feminine into this impersonal realm so that she can come into it now the idea of seduction abduction and uh, uh that aspect is the unconscious side of it you know it needs to be done consciously so we need to be allured and fascinated by it but we don't we can't be abducted by it but we often are abducted by it but we'll we'll just talk about that in just the uh the the um how the feminine energy uh it, it changes that we'll just uh, this was her uh this dream that she this woman had the with the ghostly lover who lives in the moon you know this is uh he comes regularly in his uh his, his crescent ship uh, of the new moon to receive a blood sacrifice which she has to make to him a blood sacrifice so it's a sacrifice of her life force you know it has nothing to do with spiritual he's in need of her 
you know, uh, your spirit is in need of substance and substance is in need of spirit. So she gives him substance, the blood sacrifice. And uh, the girl lives in freedom uh, when he's gone, but at the approach of the new moon, she has to become, uh, obey him with irresistible force. Now we're going to come up with this next time on the demands uh, that women have today to become conscious, you know, and that means to uh, to incorporate and assimilate uh, 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 the this this uh, uh, very flighty uh, ass and but yet very powerful aspect of discrimination and differentiation, and bring it into the realm of of the body and of relatedness, you know, and yet do it uh, so we're conscious of it, you know, um, and uh, uh, so this, she's obeying an irresistible force, she has to climb a lonely height, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, as, as she does this, this moon god changes into a sacrificial vessel, uh, uh, which uh, now consumes itself, but is again renewed, and this, uh, so it sacrifices itself, and this smoking blood of of the god of the new moon is turned into many colored leaves and flowers. So uh, by the blood received, she she she's transformed this this one who turned her into an unconscious figure, the rapacious beast, and she has has incorporated him. But what she did was uh, to give him the, the life force consciously. And then he, he became in service to her by uh, uh, bringing her these many colored leaves and flowers. So the spiritual principle lo lost its dangerously compulsive and destructive character. Now, this is what we're going to learn in all the fairy tales, animus fairy tales, is the dangerously compulsive and destructive char character that the animus can possess. But then she receives an independent life and an activity of her own as a gift from that. Now, this comes up with in, the, in Bluebeard, you know, Amandus, the one who must be loved, is his name. It's an interesting name, the one who must be loved. Now he lures the girl to his house, gives her wine to drink, and then he's he is uh, uh, one who seduces women and then destroys them. But uh, in, in an impulse of love, she embraces him, and she, he robs him of his power, and he dissolves into the air. But first promises to stand by her side. As a helpful spirit. Now, this is a again this uh, how you know, you know what Jung says that enlightenment through men comes through mental capacities, but enlightenment in women comes through always through love, real enlightenment. You know, uh, becoming uh, you know very knowledgeable and and a scholar is not uh, really enlightenment. The, what it somehow has to be translated into uh, 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 an aspect of 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 every function but the thinking function you know sensation intuition and feeling you know it somehow has to come to those realms and that's what we're going to encounter when we talk about music you know or dance this is this is a real enlightenment for women you know, uh, and it is it has a creative aspect which comes from the animus. But in, anyway, um, there is this. Uh, 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 let me see, I'm missing a page here. Uh, okay, uh, so um, the uh, uh, sh she uh, th this in these visions, uh, this important archetypal, well. Uh, form of the animus uh, uh, appears uh, in uh, this bridegroom uh, of the of the ghostly uh, god of the moon, and by giving her psychic energy, she and by embracing a terrifying monster, the which is this compulsive, destructive side of the animus. The girl destroys his power uh, with and through love. 
you know through that's the idea of the enlightenment through love now uh it 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 call, comes up in in also in the cult of dionysus i mean all of dionysus's a uh um attendants were raving maenads you know this was these unconscious uh women uh wild and and uh god intoxicated madness uh who would uh you know give him constant blood sacrifices through animals and uh uh they never become conscious you know but they're his oracular form you know and it's reminiscent of two uh uh this this luring aspect uh, uh and making dionysus makes these women uh his his servants but they are unconscious of the pied piper of hamlin now what what's interesting about what does the word pied mean you know it means two colored you know uh and it it comes this is the uh uh his he's two colored but what are his colors you know they are uh two functions uh yellow and red that's uh uh intuition and uh and feeling you know uh and he now where's the thinking function not none here this is a uh uh, uh the, he is one who lures through music you know I, I was thinking too Anna yesterday the orange walls could also be a mixture of gold and uh and feeling too you know not just uh, intuition and feeling but um so it, now he lures it, uh, all these people or uh children and uh women uh, through music and uh, uh, they disappear into the mountain now this is really uh, the pied piper is orpheus you know orpheus was this uh uh figure who uh you know uh, had gotten this liar he was orpheus is supposed to mean the best singer you know literally the the best musician best poet and apollo taught him how to play and he could not only charm uh, uh, women, but animals, and even uh, make uh, trees and stones dance. <laughs> now, you, you know, his wife Eurydice uh, dies, and she goes to uh, Hades, or to the underworld, and he goes down there and softens the hearts of Hades and Persephone, and she allows, um, they allow him to lead his wife out of Hades but he's not to look back until they're out but as he reaches the opening of the cave anxious that she's going to be with him he turns around and she disappears forever now uh Orpheus at one time was a a uh, a worshiper of Dionysus but then he became a worshiper of Apollo and uh, 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 one time when he was paying tribute to Apollo uh, at, at dawn, he was near uh, the oracles of, of Dionysus and they saw him and they, uh, they killed him for two reasons. One, he was an infidel. And the other one, because he, you know, forsake uh, Dionysus is a, an apostate, you know. And then they, the other one is they were, tired of him mourning his dead wife you know they just <laughs> we're tired of this you know and and so then his his singing head you know goes into uh there's just these beautiful paintings of his his head uh which still sang as it floated down the stream you know uh in there but that's the uh, that that is an aspect of uh it's too mysterious for us to consider right now but the the pied piper of hamlin is very similar to this and what does he lure with he lures um uh with uh music you know uh now it, the idea of where did all of these um figures go you know um you, you know they uh uh they uh this typical animus phenomena 
it's difficult to explain this feeling of being irresistibly lured and where are we lured to we're led away into some unknown distance of waters, forests, mountains, and the underworld. And so we sort of disappear into nature in the underworld. Well, this means we're really kind of becoming unconscious. And uh, she she mentions a couple, uh, you know, Mary Rose, uh, who went to the island that wants to be visited. But while she waits, she hears her name called and she follows the voice and vanishes completely. And when she comes back, her her life is completely gone and everyone's aged. Her son has grown up and moved away. You know, uh, that uh, is, uh, um, I don't know if they have. Uh, and the other one was the lady from the sea. Uh, she, these are cu current uh, uh, literary works that um, she, uh, that she had a man uh, that was on a ship that she fell in love with. He murdered his captain and had to flee. And she wants to break off their engagement. But he says, no, we can't break it off. He's gone for 20 or 30 years. He comes back and uh, then she disappears into the sea with him. You know, so we're vanishing into nature or the underworld. Uh, you, you know, uh, we've, we've withdrawn from consciousness. Psychic energy withdraws from all application to life. Now, this is the idea of being possessed by the destructive side. We disappear into some other world we know not where. The world we go into is more or less a conscious fairyland where we play hide and seek with the angels, you know. And uh, it, it often uh, these worlds are so distant and lie at such depths that no recollection of them can ever penetrate our waking consciousness which is the problem you know these realms are very important but they need to penetrate waking consciousness so um, we need to we need to visit these worlds but we need to do it consciously so uh even when we return to ourselves we cannot say what took place in the interval well we need to say what took place in the interval you know uh, so, so that is the idea of, of being able to visit these realms led by the animus, but to be conscious doing it. And uh, now the spirit that uh, leads us there, lures us there, uh, you know, this luring aspect, we can compare it to music, which is an abstraction and seduces us or fascinates us. In a, in a way that nothing else does. And uh, it is a, sh she says it can be understand as, uh, understood as an objectification of the spirit. It does not express knowledge in the usual way of logic and intellect, uh, nor does it shape matter. Instead, it gives sensuous uh, representation to our deepest associations and our most immutable laws. It gives sensuous representation to our deepest associations and our most unchangeable laws. Music is that expression. Uh, I, I do want to say it doesn't shape matter. You know, the, the idea of the, of the, of the he heaven hexagram, uh, number one which is the six lines it's the shaper and uh i always 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 get hexagram number two which is the earth hexagram the it says be the shaped not the shaper you know so that's the creative aspect of the heaven is it's a shaper you know and uh it's the I Ching says over and over again you need to be the shape. You need to come down to the earth and be earth. You know, uh, you know, assume your swan garments or, you know, become a swan. You know, don't, uh, you can't uh, unite with the anima unless you become a swan. So um, now the spirit, uh, this is a spirit, again, leading us into obscure distances beyond the reach of consciousness. Uh, in a content that cannot be grasped with words, but somehow it can be grasped with numbers, 
in the form of rhythm and scale. Now, this is the animus of music. The spirit of mu the spirit of music is is a is a masculine aspect that comes and unites with nature, you know. So uh, it is a, uh, it is also always related to feeling and sensation. You know, there's intuitive aspects in it, of course, but it's all it's related most uh, profoundly to feeling and sensation. And it shows that music admits us to the depths where spirit and nature are one or have become one. You know, this is uh, um, so interesting, this uh, what music really is. You know, it's symbolic of nature, music, in her transitory and ever-changing aspect. And in that aspect, it's relative. But it also contains an underlying reality, which is absolute. So it, it has a in the, in the fact of that it represents nature in her transitory and ever changing aspect, it's relative. But the fact that it also contains something below it that which is never changes, and it expresses a harmony between the cosmic spheres and between the life of nature. You know. There's a there's a relationship, a, a communication between the cosmic spheres and nature, and uh, it it is a it is a just a miraculous ability. It has miraculous abilities for appropriate expression of that uh, dialogue between the cosmic spheres and nature. And it, so it, it expresses the ordered pattern of the cosmos, but it also expresses, it has this ability uh, to express or communicate uh, relatedness. You know, there's a, a relationship uh, in this aspect that um, it, it contains uh, the, it, it, it expresses this, this is, it shows us the connection and the relationship between all things, that all things are created, are related. And yet it also shows us this underlying reality. I mean, it's just, I, I just love to hear uh, the people talk or try to write poetically or symbolically about music or art. Uh, so it's an element of self-expression. It's related to the graphic arts in its uh, that it represents nature. It's 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 sort of in, in, uh, you you know imitates rather nature in its rhythm and its movements. Uh, you know they mention the song of the storks. You can actually see the stork as you listen and expresses coherent emotions while simultaneously expressing coherently objective forms, you know, the forms of the spheres. So it, ex it expresses coherently both form and, and emotions. And from the deepest tones to the highest tones, it expresses uh, the great leaps, the great anguishes, the pathos, and it all expresses them all spatially in space you know and uh, it occupies the space music occupies the space between the deepest valleys and the highest mountain peaks now they also say that uh you, you know the masculine aspects of 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 uh are uh, of do re mi fa sol la ti do the masculine aspects are fa do so and re and then the feminine aspects are la mi and ti uh which uh uh you know do re mi fa so la ti do uh so you have uh, uh uh the the now they the um the masculine aspects uh are linked to fire and air and the and the fe feminine aspects are uh, re 
uh, related to earth and water. And uh, the, the clash between those two in music, in music is related to, uh, uh, has an aspect of, of death. Now see, Orpheus and the Pied Piper of Hamelin are uh, somewhat death factors. They always lead us somewhere uh, into an unconscious realm, into, you, you know, into the other world. Now, the whole idea is, can we stay conscious while they do it? Or are we going to go there forever and never come back? You know, so how do we become conscious of those things? All, all symbols and meanings are at root musical or have to do with sound. Uh, singing is a harmonization of successive melodic elements, an image of, of the natural relationship between all things. Simultaneously, it is a communication, expression of communication, and thus is, is, the spreads the exaltation of the inner relationships and identity which link all things together. And, and Plato uh, said that uh, every, every nation had a music uh, which could never be changed without fundamentally changing its culture. It was a tone or resonance that, that uh, expressed that nation. You know, and in fairy tales, musicians uh, are often, uh, this is the idea of the earth and air, uh, earth and water meeting fire, and air. In fairy tales, musicians are often associated with the fascination of death. The Pied Piper, Orpheus, all allude to this. So music uh, secretly represents the intermediate realm between the differentiated material world and the undifferentiated uh, realm of images. Well, what is the animus? He he's he is the bridge, you know. So the Pied Piper of Hamlin, Orpheus, they 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 do it through music, and uh, uh, this this is why you often find music in rituals uh, or liturgies because it uh, you know will uh, transform uh, or or transport us from one realm to the other realm, so that we become. We stop being literal people and we become symbolic people. So uh, anyway, music is is a very powerful animus uh, figure. Um, now, um, the this is um, the the abduction by spirit to cosmic musical realms remote from the world of consciousness is a is a co counterpoint to the conscious mentality. It usually is directed only towards, uh, which the conscious mentality of women is usually directed only towards very immediate and personal things, okay? So the animus and the masculine energies are going to introduce one who is, is directed towards very immediate and personal things and is going to add to them an aspect of the uh, very abstract and very impersonal things. So uh, the uh, experience of abduction is by no means harmless or unambiguous. On the one hand, it may be no more than a lapse into unconsciousness, sinking away into sort of a sleeping twilight state, slipping back into nature, equivalent to regressing, to a former level of consciousness, uh, therefore uh, useless, even dangerous. On the other hand, it may be what it should be is the genuine religious experience that is of the highest value. You know, it, Jung says in the vision seminars, I think it's so beautiful that uh, in, in a participation mystique uh, that uh, we don't, when we go around and, and you somebody you you have a thought, you know. Uh, somebody says, uh, uh, "I had a a bird told me, or the tree leaves whispered to me, 
or you know a, a, a rabbit told me or something in other words we in a participation mystique we don't think the trees think the the, the birds think the the other thing young says it's only at this level that we can experience while conscious genuine revelation and this was uh you know philemon told him this when he says that uh do you think that you created your own thoughts you know it's a it's a real uh sort of a uh uh illumination of that little episode in the red book do you think that you created your own thoughts do you think when a deer walks into a meadow that it, you did that so so what young is saying when we can reach and young said this is where i learned psychological objectivity okay now everybody says well what does that mean you know it means that when you're you know when he 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 would say to his people uh, this you, you know he says right after that in memories dreams and reflections he says and then i could say to a pe person shh be quiet something is happening okay so in other words a, an image or a, 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 a an expression is going to come in their consciousness which is going to provide uh a symbolic aspect and so that's what uh the only reason i'm mentioning that is this slipping back to nature is equivalent to regressing to a former level of consciousness uh, which can go in two ways you know one is we can experience psychological objectivity where we could say um this expression is not from me and, and once you have established this aspect of the distance from that then young says oh and only when you do it only when you can become the witness of your thoughts and the witness of what comes into your awareness can you experience genuine revelation in active imagination you know now <laughs> does that is that easy i don't know i mean it takes practice but i mean the whole idea is is this uh is to go down into these realms awake and not become uh you know uh, uh lapse into unconsciousness sinking away into a sleeping twilight state but to uh, have the genuine uh religious experience that's of the highest value your own personal one by the way and and by the what we what do we mean by religion we, you, you know it's basically that we've created the uh uh we have brought uh that thing which cannot be created by nature and can't be created by ego alone into the world which is either the divine child or the philosopher's stone that's what happened when we do this you know when we stay conscious don't slip into this sleeping twilight state so it's just a now now this is just sort of it it, it it sort of hints about something that need, none of us here really have experienced and yet if we do experience it maybe we'll be ready for it uh, by hearing these things and how do we practice i mean it, that that little uh, thing about the psychological objectivity and that illumination of it by young uh it was a complete news to me and yet it was extremely valuable i think you know this idea of that only when we can become the witness to everything that happens in us and say so so now we're back here everything that happens in us is like a deer walking in the meadow shh be quiet something is happening then you see it now from this level then uh what what you've done is this you have left the the throne of the king in the dominant function okay you are no longer sitting as the king in the throne of the dominant function you by by moving away see the king in the throne of the dominant function is 
the one who says all of these are come from me you know everything here just is my i am the king here this is sort of the ab uh, this is the whole idea of sacrifice is you're not sacrificing ego you're sacrificing uh being the king on the throne with the dominant function and this is what psychological objectivity is you know and this is what the animus provides but we need to do it from this level over here you know because all, then then everything that comes into our heads from then on uh we can have uh be like prometheus that we are not going to give up our our feet on the ground to anybody everything that comes to us we are going to be a witness of and not a victim of you know this is what they really teach in musical uh therapy you know which was done in the in the uh mid middle ages and the early part of the renaissance was teaching people to become the conductor of existence and not its victim you know and i think this you you do this by this not becoming un, uh, by going to these in state states not unconsciously in a sleeping twilight state but to uh to really have have a at the highest value come to us now this is going to be you know this is the uh, uh now we're talking about the uh uh, the star-headed god guarding in its hand a blue bird you know the bird of our own soul you know <laughs> this is no longer the high, lower or higher animus we're getting at a very high level here so along with the figures mentioned which shows the animus in its mysterious dangerous aspect there stands this figure the star-headed god guarding in its hand the blue bird the our own soul the, the function of guarding the soul belongs like that of guiding the soul to the higher suprapersonal form of the animus. Now, this is the form of the animus that is uh, never will be subordinated to, uh, 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 to our awareness. This higher animus does not allow itself to change into any function uh, subordinate to consciousness, but remains a superior entity and wishes to be rec recognized and respected as such it uh you know the this figure in my uh uh active imagination says i do not want to be worshipped i want you to collaborate with me don't worship me i i reject your worship you know it wants us to collaborate but it but it's going to be very uh independent of us so in the Indi Indian vision of the dancer and the, the higher masculine uh, principle, this star-headed god was represented in the figure of the king. Now he's the commander, but not in a sense of the magician, but in the sense of the superior spirit who lets us dance of our own volition. Okay. That was his what he how he freed us from the lower animus, the magician was by letting us dance of our own volition. So now he is not the son of the lower mother, but an ambassador of a distant unknown father, a super personal power of light. Now, uh, this distant unknown father is has nothing to do with anything you've thought of. Uh, think of it as heaven over heaven. You know, when R Ramakrishna, when anyone came to him, he would always ask them, do you like to think of your God as an impersonal energy or as a, a personal a personification? You know, and, it, and whatever they would tell him, then he would speak in that language. But this distant, uh, unknown father, you know, would be more like uh, either Fani's or Abraxas. You know, it's this uh, uh, energy out of which... Uh, you, you know, this is so interesting. In every, um, everything comes out of nothingness. You know, uh, how did how did God come to be? There was nothingness, and suddenly he comes out. He says, I want to be. Before there was nothingness. He created himself, you know. 
It's just such a wonderful image. Out of nothingness, I create myself. You know, I mean, and but we do this every day. You know, <laughs> I mean, we should anyway. You know, is is uh, uh, you, you you know that um, uh, what what Shveta Ketu picks up the figs. You know, his father tells him to pick up a fig and split it in half. What do you see? He says, I see all these little seeds. Take a seed, cut the seed in half. What do you see? And he says, I see nothing. And he says, out of that nothing, this great fig tree came. Out of that nothing, this great universe came. Out of that nothing, you came. Thou art that, Shveta Ketu. So, you know, the idea is that... Uh, I think is that this uh, realm which music takes us to, you know, is is a uh, what 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 do they call that a shunyata, you know, this full emptiness, emptiness that's very full, you know, that's very high up level. But um, anyway, uh, the uh, idea is um, uh, that. Uh, the uh, there is also uh, the personal animus. All the uh, e is the uh, appearing is the personal animus that belongs to her as an individual, not this uh, religious aspect. And this is the masculine spiritual element, which corresponds to her natural gifts, and can be developed into a conscious function or attitude coordinated with the totality of her practical personality. So it appears in dreams as a man with whom she's united. Now, this is the practical animus, either by ties of feeling or blood or by a common activity. And uh, it's, it, it is recognized as either the higher or the lower animus. And this is, these are all the male figures that we, we uh, either contact in life or in dreams. You know, uh, the teacher who instructs us, the, the priest who practices a ritual dance with her, a painter who paints our portrait, a workman named Ernest. Now, I, I, every time I go through this, I try to see them. The workman named Ernest, the elevator boy named Constantine. Now, you just see the richness of these images of the animus, that how it can be. The teacher, the priest who dances with us, the painter, who paints our portrait, the workman named Ernest. Now, it's just every one of these is an energy. The elevator boy named Constantine, who takes service with her, and uh, and uh, the uh, uh, an independent and rebellious youth, or some sinister Jesuit, or some uh, uh, tradesman who offers us all kinds of wonderful things. Now, these are all animus energies uh, that have to do with practical life. A distinctive stranger, this unknown being, familiar to us in spite of his strangeness. And they all are ambassadors. And, and, and they bring us a message or command from a distant prince of light. Okay. They inform us, you know. I mean, all these... Uh, that's the idea of the diversity of the masculine uh, spirit because it had no biological task. It goes into everything and it brings us all these different messages. And with the, uh, which, um, uh, by the way, are, are, are just gifts to us, our own consciousness. You know, these, they, uh, they are to be incorporated and assimilated in us. And so that we can use them in practical life. And we're not going to be the servants of any of these figures. We're going to glean something from them, which we can use in our practical life. And with passages of time, uh, such figures as those described become familiar shapes. And, in, uh, and in, uh, as we walk through the outer world, we meet them often. And so one learns to understand why now this figure constantly appears. Now we can talk in our dreams. We can talk to them and ask them for advice or help. I ask the anima for the help all the time because, you know, I'm the, 
I'm the, I'm the one who needs to be shaped. And I'll tell you, every time I ask her, she gives me an on, uh, answer which is absolutely astonishing and, and, you know, like breaks past the gate that I would never have ever dreamed of that answer. And because I'm not in that realm, she is. Uh, uh, she has that energy. All these masculine figures also have some knowledge that we don't possess. Not outer ones, but inner ones who we have dialogues with. And uh, so our attention must always be alert to prevent one or these forms of an uh, animus from arrogating or uh, uh, demanding supremacy or dominating our personality. Uh, the only th we need to discriminate, and this is going to come up in the first uh, what the part that we go on. The absolute most important thing in, in in our relationship with this helpful animus is to discriminate between ourselves and this figure, and sharply to limit its sphere of power. It's it's so important. That's how we stay conscious in the musical uh, when we go into this twilight sphere. Only by doing so is it possible to free oneself from the fateful consequences of identifying with the animus, animus and being possessed by it. This was, um, you know, Barbara Hanna said that Young had such a, an allergy to this that when anyone, he could detect it immediately in the women he worked with, ones that were coming and they, it wasn't their voice speaking. It was the animus within them speaking. He recognized it immediately. And Barbara Hanna says, you learn very quickly that you were to speak consciously to him and not use your animus for, uh, to, to talk to him. You were to talk to him out of your own heart, you know, and uh, not, not using the voice of the animus. So hand in hand with this discrimination, goes the growth of consciousness. This is the absolute demand of, of women on women right now is to become conscious and to grow in their consciousness. And, and it's always been, it's for everyone really, not just women. The realization of our true uh, being, which now becomes the decisive factor. And so this, um, it's, this it's a spirit common to all women. And it can related to the individual women, uh, woman as a soul guide or helpful genius, but it can never be subordinated to her her, uh, 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 her conscious mind. But neither can she become to it. The situation is is uh, um, somewhat different in the fact in the objective practical part that we can assimilate. But there's but the spiritual aspect that is supra personal is the aspect that we'll we can't uh will never be subordinated to so uh but we can get help uh both in in well yeah, let me give you one example and i'll kind of maybe close on this is uh I'm th i think i've told this dream before but you know uh marie louise von franz had bought uh, uh some land near bollingen and she was going to build a tower there very near young's uh, house and uh she she hadn't bought the land yet and uh she was negotiating it and she, the next day she was supposed to sign the contract and she's thinking oh i've never been in debt before you know uh what what if i lose my job what if i don't can't pay the loan back you know she's got all these horrible uh uh, anxiety about it okay then she has a dream that she's standing on this one place where you, in switzerland where you can see 200 miles you know and and on this mountain peak 200 miles away she sees this little dot that comes off it, and it keeps coming closer and closer and she thinks it's a bird and then suddenly she sees it's a skier and then the skier comes down and lands right beside her and with a flourish, snow flying up in the air, you know, and she sees it's a young boy, a young Swiss boy. And she says to him, she says, how did you do that? 
And, and he says, I don't know. He says, I just closed my eyes and jumped. No, no the whole idea was this. She knew now that she could sign the contract. She just needed to close her eyes and jump. And who helped her make the decision? It wasn't the supra personal animus that brings us all these revelations, which we can never subordinate to our conscious consciousness. It was the helpful boy, you know, the elevator boy named Constantine, the wor the help, the worker named Ernest. You know, so so you see, there's these two levels. Now we'll get more into this, but uh, so we have have both this aspect here which helps us to to uh act in the outer world uh, uh objectively and rationally and without with, with in an abstract way and then also uh allows us to connect with uh you, you know the distant the star-headed god you know who holds the our soul in his hand guarding it and guiding it well, anyway, uh, that that's the unconscious side of the animus. And then next time we're going to get into a little bit more of how it works on the conscious level. So I hope I didn't. Uh, it's always uh, Marie, uh, Marion Woodman always said, now you never take any of this literally. Marion Woodman says that whenever she talked about the animus, that she always got in a lot of trouble because people took it too literally. Because, uh, you, you, you know, um, we live in a kind of age of political correctness and stuff. And she, she said it was just like walking on eggshells. But what we're really talking about is the symbolic world, you know, and how it can be a help to us, you know, and what it really is. Now, we're not talking about anything about in, in sociocultural life. We're talking about you uh, an I and a thou, you as an individual, not as a a uh, a person who who has rights in society. It's you as an I and them as the thou. And it's a one to one I to thou. Everything we're talking about is I and thou, you know. And and I think that kind of defangs a lot of this. I hope, but. I always get in big trouble. Well, anyway, let's just go around the room. I, I don't know if, how clear I was. I'm, well, I've my actually, wife's gone. I'm a little crazy today. I actually got a, a question for our therapist here. So, you know, I think I could tell when someone was speaking from the heart, you know, but I would not know when a woman is speaking from the animus. How would you tell that, to throw that out there? If someone wants to take a swing. And anyone can take a swing at that. Uh, let, let me just give one example, and maybe Susan, you can, or Diane, or anybody can, uh, Azine can speak to it. But uh, what what uh, what Marie Louise von Franz says is it gives us it 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 gives us generally accepted truths, which don't fit this mm. particular situation. Right. You know, so right. it's something that is always generally true. But is it really what this person needed right now? You know, and, and, and or does it address the Tao of this moment? Or is it just some, you know, generally accepted truth? But anyway, yeah, let's Susan like or they're... Azine or Diane or anybody. Ava. It's like they're giving everything about the issue except that which is actually important <laughs> right yeah what what is what what is the um what is the i thou uh consciousness that i can bring to this situation because that's the immediate and the near at hand what what it what we don't want or what what young thought was uh not a, uh was anything that was abstract and far away you know uh was that really coming out of us or was it go ahead azine you I can kick that... my butt too if you need to go ahead <laughs> i think um it's um when the woman is possessed by animals that's what you're 
thing it's uh, the position can but, you um, sense it in their voice or what they say to you yeah they're very um it's just like they know everything very very self-righteous and they know it all it just they're giving their truth the capital t to you and um sometimes it's also when they have opinions about everything like photography mechanics politics everything you say um they have an opinion the other sign is that they quote a lot from famous people like Jung, Jung said this said this that and a kind of um something that looks like logic but it's not really logic also too much generalization too much generalization is a sign of it's a kind of logic but it's not logic yeah like you hear them say all men are like this all americans are like this liberals are like this. too much generalization but this is um when they're talking from an animus that has possessed them all these things can go to a better state status um when they experience uh, living animals yes. it's the highest level of integration with the ants so they can have their own voice they can have original thoughts they know what they're talking about because they have researched a lot they have read a lot they have thought a lot about the subject so you understand that they're coming from a place of originality and uh, but knowing what they're talking about experience i love the you did it that was wonderful i've seen the opinion aspect the generalization have opinions about everything but is where is the experiential you know where is the things that you can say that is your from your own uh experience and revelation yeah i mean you see you you're yeah go ahead uh dahlia so I just have a question because sometimes when the same is you can hear the same from a man like something very completely abstract mm -hmm. and just theoretic and like oh, yes abortion's not right I don't know something like very yeah. not connected to the I don't know to the to the can I answer that I mean, yeah please yeah. so the system that i work with the way i explain it is that um male and female form and um, that is what we call men and women uh, in this system um male and female form both show signs of animal animus manifestation like if i'm a woman I'm expressing animal in some superficial level. Like I have feelings, everything that we talk about animal is present in a woman, but in a superficial way, it's like the first touch. Then, and also in a man, right? Most of us, because animal and animals are incredibly uh, deep in our psyche and almost every one of us is possessed by their energy. So as a woman, I manifest aspects of animal and I'm possessed by animals. So I expressing the lowest uh, and worst aspects um, of animals. Then when I grow, I do personal growth, uh, I manifest deeper, better levels, better faces of animals. And then I go deeper and I rediscover animal because it's within the animals. So everything that you see as generalization, whatever, um, in a man is um, as a male form. So this is 
superficial manifestation of the worst uh, faces of animals. But yeah. women are really, really stubborn when they uh, come to our opinions, just their, uh, their fears. So it's worse in women when generalization happens. Um, I think it's worse in women. Well, well, let me give you give you an example from a fairy tale. Uh, you know the bear uh, who uh, you, you know in was it rose uh, rose red and Snow, Snow White, White. You know who who kills that one you're talking about, Dahlia, the little uh, dwarf who's full of opinions. And finally, I mean, he just he, he now. See, there is an asculate aspect. The, the true aspect of masculine consciousness is one that is, well, Jung said this, uh, it, first of all, it's, it's sort of like Merlin or the green man. You know, they don't go around telling you all these op opinions. And so, so, you know, men can be animus possessed as well as women. So these ones that are giving you all these, I am right, I am right type people. Jung said, yes, half the world is right and half the world is wrong, but that doesn't mean half the half of the people are right and half the people are wrong. It means you are half right and half wrong, and you would be much better off finding out what is wrong in you and what is right in your neighbor than to, to, to try to do it otherwise. Now, this is from the Red Book, you know, and, and the idea is sort of a Socratic method, you know, instead of, of going and, and, and imposing uh, a p opinion on people. Now, this is, this is not the animus possessed man, let's say this. In, instead of uh, going and imposing your opinion on people, you are going to, uh, what does educera mean? It means you draw forth. You don't impose, you draw forth. This is knowledge. This is how we learn. You know, uh, do, do you think the scientific method does that? You know, I mean, if it's done properly, it is totally open to being proven wrong at any moment. All it has to go by is what is the current level of experience. And it doesn't hold to it uh, with, with religious devotion. Uh, what, what do you say? Uh, I find that a lot people nowadays that people are are uh, holding to certain points of view with fanaticism, partisanness, and that's not the green man. That's not Merlin. That's not this bear who slaps this uh, opinionated dwarf <laughs> and kills him. Although he later becomes the uh, Mary's <laughs> one of the remember when he comes in the back of his other thing. Azine, did you have a, a something to add about that? Or We're not? asking because we see your hand up. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. No, I just said that um so I'm female and male for like a man who's um like this dwarf, um they they show lower aspects um of animals. So it's, it's really, really close to being a woman being possessed by animals because in possession, we also manifest the lowest aspect. I think uh, I, the number of animus possessed men, I think I'll over number the number of animus possessed women, you know, seriously, that means that their feminine aspect is so unconscious in them that they're, it, it, that they are now the negative animus of either the mother or something in themselves is speaking through them. It's no, changing. Ahead. It's yeah. changing. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Daniel. I have another question. When you speak uh, being possessed, so it's kind of when you kind of are unconscious of the possession, and then when you realize that you project, then you become conscious. Is that right? Or Exactly. That's what we're going to talk about next time. How difficult it is to know that we're possessed. You know, I mean, that that, she, that Emma Young says this is the hardest thing of that. She says the only way that she could tell it, and Barbara Hanna and Von Franz said the same thing. The only way that I could tell, because I would be possessed sometimes and sometimes I'm not possessed. 
you know, Edward Eniger said he'd see it in, in an analytical hour. This person goes from being the uh, conscious to unconscious to the shadow to the the symbolic personality. But with the way von Franz and Emma Young and Barbara Hennesses, they would test it is to see what effect they had on other people. You know, if they saw other people getting all, you know, nervous and tense, they knew that perhaps they were speak, they were being momentarily possessed by their own animus and that they needed to be conscious of that and to uh, to uh, um, be aware of it. And, and, and I'm not saying those who can't do teach. So I'm not saying I'm yeah, let's try to get a few more opinions. Yeah, here. sure. Uh, Susan, would you uh, like to speak? Um, great conversation. Great. Thank you, Craig, too. It was, um, and Azim, you're very, very knowledgeable. Um, yeah, I think in clinically, what I have found is, and I'm thinking of just, you know, maybe a couple of people that I'm working with right now, but that, um, you know, there's either an inflation or a deflation usually. And, um, and when, and, it, and oftentimes, I think maybe because it's in therapy, um, the animus turns on, you know, mm -hmm. the client. And so it's very negative. So they're, so I don't find it that problematic because I feel like most women want to be liberated from that. They don't want to be possessed. And there's a really um, kind of coming home feeling to kind of getting out of that. And, um, you know, I loved the, um, something you just said, Craig, um, but it just made me think of the animus as sort of being almost have the potential to be kind of an Archimedean point that really gets outside of the situation and the possession. I mean, so it's maybe it can do both. I don't know. Um, and um, so, and, and I think it, I, I thought, I found it very interesting reading too what Emma Young said about that, that, you know, oftentimes the most masculine kind of presenting woman is the woman who really needs to develop her masculine more. Yeah. And um, so, and I think for me personally, one of the things that I'm realizing kind of are these more subtle levels of possession where there's an enchantment and um, I'm really trying to pay more attention to that because I got very enchanted by something in the spring and it was just a pot, you know, I was listening to something, a podcast, and I was very, it was very interesting, but I got just totally enchanted and I fell and I hurt myself. And, <laughs> you know, it was, I just kept thinking, why did I fall? What was going on? And I, I really think I was enchanted. I mean, it was really helpful to kind of have that, that insight. So, um, yeah, yeah, that, thank you. That's, that's so important, Susan, is, is this is what Emma Young says. The most masculine appearing woman, you would think that they need to become more feminine. No, mm -hmm. they need to become more conscious of the masculine. Mm -hmm. And through becoming more conscious of the masculine, then they can become feminine. Now we'll, we'll go over that next time, but it's, uh, it is, uh, uh, that's a wonderful point. Susan. Susan, that was very helpful too. Let, yeah, let's hear everybody. Uh, oh, okay. This is uh, getting very good here. Well, there's so many things I don't know, what but since you just were talking about uh, women who presented as masculine needed to get more in touch with the masculine, I started thinking about women politicians like mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton and, and Nancy Pelosi. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to, to um, survive in that situation, you, you can, you have to have, you know, I, I, I'll take Nancy Pelosi. I was just thinking about her, how incredible her career has been that she's been able to deal with all of these men in the political realm and keep and hold her 
own. And, you know, you have to present, and, and yet, you know, uh, to also uh, maintain her values for human rights, for example. So it's very complicated, I think. Can you still hear me? I think my earbuds are dying. Let me know if I go out. Um, So there's that. And then, you know, we all have, uh, you know, the, the, the goal in individuation is for each of us to uh, integrate the masculine and the feminine in ourselves. So, um, and I, you know, it's easier to see these things in other people. So one way, I mean, one of the best ways to see when a man is being overly masculine, <laughs> that's all that I can see. That's very frequent. But uh, so, but to, and very not so frequent to see the feminine in a man. So, you know, in our society. Um, and then, so maybe I could um, be an example here. Uh, so my question for you yesterday, um, Craig, was, you know, when you said we can tell when... Um, when we we are um, getting out of our, um, I don't know, maybe when you you said when when we we can tell when we're in the we can be conscious in the twilight zone that music leads us to. Mm-hmm. If we leave the king in the throne of oh, our yeah. dominant function and that's another question i put to you yesterday too because you're an intuitive and i would think most of us here are intuitive people who are attracted have and are two intuitives most of us not everyone but as a dominant function but um so am i not leaving my am i being possessed by putting this question to you again a second time now as intuitives like you said uh, that it's in the fourth dimension that comes from the fourth dimension outside of time so can we be um, if we if we are intuitives and we are led by music into the twilight is our dominant function a negative yeah. now so i'm putting it to you first of all is that a possession in me and i open this question to any of you because it's difficult to see in yourself well, well, it's so t- difficult to see in yourself Typically, here's what an intuitive does. They have all, uh, uh, who it's their dominant function. They have prescriptions for everybody. You know, some, they get some revelation. They say they should teach this in the schools. Okay, you know? so then that could be a, a, a possession, a, a, a masculine or a... a well, I'm just Animus saying it, let's, we're not me. talking about masculine and feminine when <laughs> we're talking I'm about. Because I'm insisting on this again to ask you this question. So that's my question to you. Yeah. Can you observe that in me? And, you know, everybody, I think, sometimes gets possessed by either one in, in the real world. You know, eventually, some of us are, are not totally enlightened. So, or most of us are not. To- haven't totally reached that enlightenment mm-hmm. so um and i'm asking myself is that 
a possession, an animus possession in me because no, I, I'm insisting on that to you for the second time, for the second day in a row. Sorry. No. So you don't have to go into no. the, the, the intuitive, but I'm asking you, can you observe that in me as an animus possession, any of you? Okay. Well, the question is open because uh, I, I want to become more aware, more conscious of that in myself. Well, the animus, it really doesn't have anything to do with the functions other than usually it's the, since I'm an intuitive, my, my anima is going to be sensate. But you, you, let me just tell you what, what we're talking about is, is that the only time we can get psychic objectivity is when we leave the throne of the dominant function. Now, this has nothing to do with the anima or animus. But here's what the intuitive does. They say they always have good ideas for everybody but themselves. So they never, what Von Franz says, reap the harvest because they never take it down to this is what I should be preaching to myself. And so they never bring it down to the reality function of sensation, which they are, uh, are is their inferior function. So they never get anywhere. You know, they, uh, the intuitive has an intuition and their sensate spouse suddenly has, has the same intuition or revelation and tells, their, tells you, and then you say, well, I knew that 20 years ago. But the sensate is now going to put it, is going has now realized it. The intuitive never realized it because they have no reality function, you know. So so how does the intuitive uh, vacate the throne of intuition? You know, that's a that's a oh wow. I mean, I that's that's really the key to me and to probably other people here, but I don't really have the answer to it. Well, let, let's hear well, let's, what let's move on and, Anna and John and uh, Charles have to say too yeah sure uh, John you want to go next yeah thank you Diane I can't give you an answer right now <laughs> yeah yeah thank you very much uh, that's interesting um, it's very been very informative for me today because when we started this I was like oh the animus yeah that's uh, you know for I need to probably learn more about the anima because you know I'm a man and uh, masculine, you know, masculine function. But now I just realized after what you had said earlier that, uh, you know, if you're not conscious of it, you could be possessed by it or, you know, um, and I think that's, you know, that's the goal is to recognize the possession and, uh, you know, to, um, yeah, it's been, it's been very informative and I learned a lot. Um, and it always amazes me about Von Franz. I mean, she was just uh, quite an amazing person. I read somewhere that she had, you know, memorized all 99 trigrams. So she would throw the I Ching before she would, you know, do something important or go on a trip. And then, you know, she didn't, she had them all memorized. So she didn't have to take the book with her, which I thought was fascinating. But um, I really, uh, I'm getting a lot out of this material. And thank you very much. Yeah. And Young didn't even need to throw the coins. Oh, really? Yeah. She, she said that he, he could tell you, she, he says you can throw the coins, but I can already tell you what it's, what hexagram will come up. So he, she oh, wow. said he'd become a living I Ching, you know, because he just knew the Tao of this moment, you know. Mm, yeah, well, let's yes. let's hear from Anna, Ava, and Charles because uh, we kind of went out of time, but it was fascinating. Well, go and next, Anna. Anna. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Excuse me. Anna, and then Ava, and then Charles. Yeah. Go ahead, Anna. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, well, um, I would add, um, uh, I mean, you already mentioned that, that, that um, in uh, animals possessed women, there is a lack of uh, I doubt relationship. And um, it, uh, I mean, I would add that there is an obvious lack of empathy and, uh, um, and uh, also the feeling for situation. The feeling function is uh, lacking, also, uh, and uh, I also think that uh, our culture is uh, because we are possessed by words, and uh, our cultural dominant function is communication. Then I think, uh, willingly or not, 
uh, where consciousness is lacking, uh, people are clinging to to certain opinions just to to be social. So this is, I mean, these are my two thoughts. That's very good, Anna. I would like to hear your story too. I mean, next time, hopefully, we can do some sharing. It's the, the first Sunday of the month. I, I wonder it'd be unrecorded, and anyway, I'd just love to. Eat. Because I, I've been very impressed by uh, you, your comments, Ava. What what is your? Uh, I'm just trying to push it, Gary. <laughs> real quick. Okay, uh, I'm uh, relating to yesterday's dream work because it felt I felt so energized and it felt like soul food in in such a, a deep way and. Um, it was Craig's uh, dream and imagination and Fa Fabio's dream about his uh, dreaming of uh, her, his astral body lying behind him. And th that was, those two was just mentioning, but it was uh, a part of the energy. And then Anna's dream, that was miraculous. Uh, I, I can't find words, but I think it was, and, and I, I'm uh, sitting here <laughs> thinking about what is this aspects of animus and anima, what was showed in that kind of energy that we uh, experienced in that. Could someone analyze it for me? <laughs> it, they must have been there somewhere, Craig. <laughs> yeah. well, well, next, next time. Uh Anna, uh, if you if you're here uh, on next Sunday, I I would like to uh, present it, your animus dream too, which we didn't put there yesterday. But it is such a beautiful animus dream, and and the fact that her animus sort of abandons her at the end or something is is just wonderful. So we we might uh, if you don't mind, Anna, we could maybe discuss your animus dream. Uh, next time too. Uh, Charles, uh, yeah. Um, Go ahead, Charles. Thank next? you, Ava. Thank you very much. Um, might be really hard to hear me. Uh, driving right now. Um, I got everything I own back in my car, and tomorrow morning I'm headed to Wyoming. Wow. Um, I wasn't able to really hear a whole lot of what happened in the session because. Um, I kept losing connection over and over again, um, but uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, I feel like I'm doing it for real this time, and uh, I can tell because yeah, I have literally everything packed in my car. There's nothing. Uh, there's no nothing turning there. back. Okay. Uh, no turning back. Yeah. Right. right, right. Oh, oh, well, thanks, Charles. Okay, well, well. Uh, now the reason we did this is is just, it's sort of an introduction to the 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 animus fairy tales we're going to do, and we just have one more part. Uh, but next time, if 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 everybody would want, it's sort of a time where we just kind of tell anything we want to tell, whatever you want to tell. Uh, Zine, uh, maybe you can tell us about what you're working on, and and just sort of give us a summary of it. And and Anne, I would and a Susan. I would love to hear your story. And Dahlia, we would like to be updated about what's going on in Lithuania and everything. So, can I yeah. have a suggestion? Yeah. I think um, every one of us can read the material. It's not anything special in re reading the material. I think what we have here is a group of people that are knowledgeable about um, Jungian concepts and they have experiences, questions, and discussions, uh, you know, I think that's our uh, strongest point uh, yes. thing here. So I suggest that we make more time for discussions and questions. Yeah. Um, to me, this is more important. I can read the material my, by myself. What I'm interested in is how this material is um, affecting people how they are receiving it. And I'm interested in knowing their points of views and questions, experience. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll do that in spades next time. And I think 
one of the things we'll do is Anna's stream. But I, I'd also like us to be learning as we're going. And and uh, uh, even if you don't read, we, we can at least just prevent a summary. But it, it's always supposed to have been half, uh, half discussion, half uh, just a synopsis. That's how we'll always allocate it, you know. I think I did go a little over this time, but anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. We'll we will more focus on that, you know, and and maybe come up with some topics for discussion. Maybe some questions, a specific question. This one was great, by the way. I thought, what does it mean to be animus possessed? I haven't answered Diane's question yet, but I'm going to continue to think about it. Okay, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll uh, see you next time then. We do have a session Tuesday at 1 p.m. Chicago. If anybody wants to come to it, we're going to start with Diane's brown horse dream. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Susan Thanks, and Gary yeah. and John and Dahlia and Anna and Ava and Charles. Have a, Good luck, Charles. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Charles, you. Yeah. Bye-bye.